pleasure to speak here. Um, I've learned a lot already earlier today and yesterday. Um, my, uh, my presentation will be entirely on uh, medically focused applications of what you could call synthetic biology. Uh, but I've tried to relate a little bit to what we heard uh, yesterday as well. So, in fact, I've heard multiple times that we have 20 amino acids. I mean, that is certainly at protein level not entirely true. We have a closer in the neighborhood to 200 different amino acids in proteins because of a process that is called post-translational modification. So 20 amino acids are encoded in the genome, but then afterwards, after the protein is synthesized or during its folding, a lot of modifications are added to those um, proteins. And my lab is focusing on the um, synthetic biology, if you wish, of those post-translational modifications. And so I just give you a chart here of the different types of post-translational modifications. I just got this from Swissprot yesterday on experimentally validated post-translationally modified uh, sites. You can see there's a whole zoo of modifications that can be added covalently or, uh, to, to proteins. And I will talk about this third most abundant one there, which is called N-linked glycosylation, which is the addition of sugars to the asparagine side chains in uh, um, eukaryotic proteins in particular. I will spend a little bit of time also on O-linked glycosylation, which is the addition of sugars to serine and threonine residues, again, in, <laughs> mostly in eukaryotic um, cells. So eukaryotic cells do perform these modifications by nature, and it's uh, our take on this that we might as well use these natural modifications and re-engineer them to introduce particular functionality into therapeutic proteins. So um, glycans are uh, not just tiny modifications on a protein. Uh, just to exemplify that, this is the crystal structure of influenza virus hemagglutinin. Um, and whatever you see on there, which is yellow, is N-linked carbohydrate. Uh, and as you can see, this covers large areas of the protein surface. So this is the immunodominant antigen in the influenza vaccines that we use today. And every area that's covered by yellow here is basically not available uh, for recognition by antibodies because of steric hindrance. Uh, steric hindrance. And this is yet a, a very conserved picture because in crystallography, very often the outer branches of carbohydrates are not, not captured because of large mobility of these uh, structures. So what you see here is effectively the part of the carbohydrate that is rigid enough to yield definable electron density in, uh, in the crystallography maps. Um, so we're playing with these uh, carbohydrate structures. Um, in effect, about 55 to 60 percent of all therapeutics we have on the market today, biopharmaceutical therapeutics, are glycoproteins. And that includes all monoclonal antibodies or molecules derived uh, from monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so it's a very important post-translation modification for the biopharmaceutical um, industry. So we've been talking yesterday about standardization, and glycobiology is a fairly recent field in its current, uh, in its current generation. And so the standards for nomenclature of carbohydrates have just been agreed upon um, about less than 10 years ago now. And there's just a few weeks ago there was an update published on this. So just like you have the four letters for the bases in DNA, and you have the 20 letters for the amino acids in proteins, we now have symbology for carbohydrates, which is universally accepted. Um, and because carbohydrates are branched structures, we cannot suffice with a linear uh, denomination of uh, consisting out of letters. Um, we need to capture stereochemistry in, uh, in this uh, symbology. And so this can be found, it's uh, defined by the Consortium for Functional Glycomics um, in here. So effectively what this uh, is useful for, uh, if you would have to capture the entire chemical detail of a carbohydrate of moderate complexity like this one, um, I think we could all agree that it's not very convenient to write that out uh, every single time that you would have to talk about uh, uh, such structures. And so the symbology now effectively allows us to reduce that complexity to something more uh, amenable also to automation and to database uh, introduction. So you'll see a lot of this um, in my talk. Uh, effectively, every symbol is a monosaccharide. Um, squares have glucose topology, so this would be N-acetylglucosamine. Um, blue, um, sorry, green dots or balls, circles, would be mannose. And mannose differs from glucose because of the actual OH hydroxyl functionality on the C2 position. And then this would be galactose, which differs from glucose because of an actual uh, hydroxyl functionality on the C4 position of the ring. 
And so these are the main topologies in the carbohydrates that I will talk about today. So um, as in other fields, we do have models about the biosynthesis of these uh, carbohydrates. And models don't always have to be quantitative. In fact, we have no idea at all about the quantitative nature of the glycosylation pathway. Um, so this is an entirely qualitative model, meaning that we know which enzymes are in which sequence after one another. Um, this is a very simplified depiction of the eukaryotic N-glycosylation pathway. So I'll just walk you through it a little bit. Um, N-glycans, so those that finally end up on the asparagine side chains of proteins, are synthesized as a uh, tetradecasaccharide precursor, so 14 monosaccharides. Um, there is an entire sequence, which I have not depicted here, of <laughs> enzymes that build up this um, lipid-linked, dolicol-linked um, precursor oligosaccharide. And then as a protein that is in eukaryotic cells destined for the plasma membrane or other intracellular membranes or for secretion outside of the cell, when su such proteins um, all contain single peptides, that's recognized by signal recognition particle in the cytoplasm until the ribosome SRP particle docks to the translocon, the SEC61 translocon in the, in the plasmic reticulum membrane. And then the protein translation resumes and the protein is kind of pumped inside the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. And at that stage, so prior to folding, these N-glycan precursors are added to the um, protein. And then um, this entire process in the endoplasmic reticulum of uh, eukaryotic cells is universally conserved in the whole eukaryotic world. And the reason for that, most likely, is that these glycans play a very important role in catalyzing the protein folding in the endoplasmic reticulum. So some of these carbohydrates, and I will not go in detail today, some of these carbohydrates recruit proteins like calnexin and calreticulin to the um, folding protein. And with calnexin and calreticulin, you get protein disulfide isomerases, which assists in um, um, resolving uh, disulfide bonds that have formed uh, inappropriately in, in the protein. And so after that has happened, so, um, so in other words, you can't touch this very much. If you remove glycans by simply mutating the sequence to which they tend to be attached, many, many proteins will simply not fold anymore in eukaryotic cells. This is also one of the main reasons why so many proteins do not fold in E. coli because E. coli does not have this machinery um, at all. Right. So that's why the biotech industry needs eukaryotic expression systems on top of E. coli um, for, for manufacturing purposes. This is the very single most important reason why that is the case. Then after um, this folding catalyzing functions have occurred, the protein is then processed to this MANOS-8 CLCNAC2 structure, and that's recognized for export from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. And in the Golgi apparatus, depending on which eukaryotic cell you're looking at, there will be an entire battery of glycosyl transferases, which I've just simplified here by this swarm of arrows, that will process that MANOS-8 structure into rather complex um, N-glycan structures that are then secreted from the cell. And this is just depicting what a pathway in a very simplified way would look like in a mammalian cell, say a liver cell that produces the majority of protein in our serum. If you'd be looking at a yeast cell, this battery of glycosyl transferases would be entirely different. So the protein is secreted, modified with an entirely different set of glycans, and that causes a whole set of problems in the biopharmaceutical industry. And this is the reason why still today, mammalian cells are the main expression hosts uh, on the eukaryotic side um, in, in that industry. So this is the um, knowledge um, that has been gathered by many, many colleagues and giants on whose shoulders we stand for then engineering this uh, pathway. Um, even in eukaryotic cells, in mammalian cells, such pathway will not convert um, in a, with 100% efficiency every intermediate to every product. And so to build this, we need about 16 enzymatic steps, starting from this MANOS-8 um, structure. And all of that has to happen in the about 10 to 15 minutes that a protein has um, between the time point when it enters the Golgi and the time point when it leaves the Golgi for secretion uh, from the cell. So in 15 minutes, you need 16 enzymes to work um, on that substrate in a sequential way to convert all of that to the final product. I think you can uh, easily understand that this is not going to happen with 100% efficiency at every step. 
And the consequence is that then you get a, the synthesis of a large array of these glycan structures, some of which would be the, similar to the final product, but most of which would be biosynthetic intermediates along that path. And this makes it very difficult to assign structure function relations to glycoproteins, to glycoforms. And so as a goal that we've set for ourselves more than 10 years ago is to design a set of eukaryotic expression systems, expression hosts, that would produce um, particular glycoforms, single structures, with a level of homogeneity that would be sufficient to be able to purify it from that uh, mixture. And so that's what I will be talking about um, today. All right. So as every synthetic biologist, one needs analytics, um, high throughput and highly reliable analytics to quantify what we are doing. And so what I did uh, back in the days when I was still a graduate student is to use DNA sequencers, capillary DNA sequencers, as the analytical platform to very quickly profile carbohydrate um, mixtures using capillary electrophoresis. And so that gave us the throughput that has been used to sequence the human genome um, to now be able to do clonal analysis of all these different um, clones that we generate uh, along this engineering path. So we label, we basically take off the sugars from the protein, if that would be the blue line, it would be the protein. Uh, we take it off with an enzyme, then we label these sugars with a fluorophore called APTS, which imparts negative charge and fluorescence to the carbohydrates. <coughs> then there's a bit of cleanup steps, and then we go on the sequencer. Um, and so the, the anode, the positive pole, will be here, the negative one will be there, and we just separate them out using electrophoresis. And just like you would do for DNA or for proteins, we include size standards, which are depicted there. That's just a hydrolysate of a um, carbohydrate polymer called starch. And, and so in this way, we can very quickly, at high throughput, analyze these um, carbohydrates. OK, sorry. So the platform that we now have built over the last 10 years uh, allows us to make every single of the structures that you see here with a homogeneity of higher than 85%. Um, and that has taken us many PhD um, theses and many postdocs work to arrive at this uh, particular um, stage. Um, what it allows us to do, amongst other things, is to target glycoproteins. So this would be the protein, that's the sugar. Of course, not in proportion here. Um, but what it allows us to do is to target biopharmaceuticals to particular tissues because different tissues in the human body express a different complement of sugar binding proteins called lectins. So uh, by injecting proteins <coughs> modified with particular carbohydrates, we can target therapeutics to particular organs. Um, and so I will talk about one particular application that we've been working on, uh, which was published in, uh, a few years ago, um, which is the modification of carbohydrates with mannose-6-phosphate residues which allows, obviously, to target mannose-6-phosphate receptors. And this is important in treating a category of human disease, which is called lysosomal starch diseases. And so I'll, I'll come back to that as we go. Our most recent addition to this uh, platform is this. And that's, I think, what um, looks most like synthetic biology. Um, we were, at a certain point, not happy anymore with what na nature had to offer. And we basically reduced complexity of this pathway to its bare minimum. Um, effectively allowing to produce just these very tiny di and trisaccharides. And I'll, I'll also explain to you why that is important, uh, at least in our mind, um, for therapeutic applications. Okay, so the first stage of this work involved uh, the, the building, the construction, the transfer of the human n glycosylation Golgi pathway module, if you wish, um, to the yeast Golgi apparatus. Um, and the reason why we wanted to do that is that yeast is tremendously more scalable in manufacturing than mammalian cell cultivation is. It's also much cheaper um, to do that. And so this is the scale at which yeast fermentation occurs in the industry. This is a factory for human serum albumin, which is built in the north of uh, Japan, where human serum albumin is um, produced in literally metric ton quantities um, for use as a serum expander, blood expander during surgery. Uh, where people just, if you don't have enough blood as a surgeon, you can take, just, take the blood you have and expand it by diluting it with a solution of serum albumin. And so the doses that you have to inject there are in the hundreds of grams. And so you can make that in yeast and you can make it in yeast only at the, for the time being. 
And so being able to construct things like monoclonal antibodies in yeast would change the economics of antibody production quite dramatically. But you need to get the glycosylation right. And so if this would be, in fact it is, the crystal structure of the FC part of human IgG. So for those of you who know, uh, for the mathematicians, antibodies are the molecules in our serum that help us combat infectious disease, amongst other things. And they have a typically Y shape. Maybe there's some chalk here. So, so human IgG has this kind of shape. Sorry for that. A little bit like this. So there's a linker region here. And what you see there is the bottom part of this. That's called the FC region. And this would be the FAP region of which you have two. These bind, for example, things on the surface of pathogens. Um, this is where then the so-called effector functions are localized. This binds to other proteins on immune cells, and that then triggers reactions like killing activity for the pathogen that sits here. Okay. So what you see here is the bottom part, and you can see the blue squares there. Those are sugars, and that's conserved in all antibodies that we have in our body. There is a universally conserved carbohydrate there and then linked glycan, of which the structures are normally like this. And what's been found about 10 years ago, that if you remove this little triangle there, just one monosaccharide, which is called fucose, the antibodies become approximately 100-fold more potent in their, in their triggering of killing activity for tumor cells. So this is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So if you remove that, uh, you get much better anti-tumor antibodies. And so this is now being commercialized by companies like Roche, um, so their newest generation of anti-tumor antibodies are manufactured in mammalian cell lines that do not make such fucose uh, anymore. Now, yeast doesn't make it in the first place, so you don't have to engineer it out, which makes this somewhat attractive. Um, also, 60% of all biopharmaceuticals today are antibodies, contain this part of the antibody um, molecule. So what we've been working on is to, you could call it, B-cellize um, the yeast. So you try and make a yeast which looks like a B cell in terms of glycosylation, at least. And so this is what yeast normally does. You see, It takes MAN8, and then it converts this MAN8 into these hugely complicated so-called hyperman oscillated structures. Whereas this is what you need on the antibody. So at first sight, it couldn't be more different, but it all comes from the same precursor structure. So by knocking out the first steps of this pathway, and then like we do here, and then building in the human pathway in a very optimized way, you could hope of arriving at least at this uh, structure. Mind that this would also require you to have all the sugar nucleotides to build these monosaccharides on top of one another, which is also, uh, certainly when we started, was not obvious at all. Certainly for galactose, it was not at all clear that yeast made UDP galactose. In fact, it turned out it does, and we still don't know um, what it makes it for in nature um, here. So to do this, to build this pathway into yeast, we need to get all of these glycosyl transferases in the appropriate location in the Golgi apparatus at appropriate expression levels and activities um, for this pathway to work with high efficiency. And so we do that by targeting the catalytic domains of these glycosyl transferases to the Golgi by fusing them to trans transmembrane signals from yeast glycosyl transferases, so enzymes that by nature go to the um, Golgi apparatus uh, of yeast. And exactly how to make that fusion, that's part of the, um, part of the optimization work that needs to be done uh, when you do this um, engineering. So this is the current um, results that we uh, we're getting from this after about 10 years of work, I must say. Um, so this is what the yeast glycosylation pathway would look like by nature very complicated, and not at all the structures you want. And then by gradually building in one glycosyl transferase after the other, we build up a glycosylation profile that looks like this, which is in fact better than what you would get from CHO K1 cells, which are the mammalian cells that are used today in biomanufacturing. So Bram Lokens is uh, working on this, uh, finishing his PhD as we speak. So we introduced also an, a new trick, which I uh, unfortunately can't tell much about yet, um, to remove all the yeast endogenous glycans. Because if you build that pathway, there will be remaining yeast endogenous glycans uh, remaining, about 10-15% of the total glycan pool. Uh, 
And that's really complicated for the pharmaceutical industry to get rid of. So you have to engineer that out, and so we'll be publishing very soon on how, how we have done that uh, now, effectively allowing us to make pretty homogeneous glycosylation profiles. Okay, we were talking yesterday, yesterday about modularity and orthogonality, and so I just thought to, this is not, not published yet, uh, but when you engineer this, um, these pathways, very often um, what we observe is that the new intermediates that we synthesize along that path, in, 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 in this case, this MANOS-5 structure, this has never been seen in evolution by the yeast glycosyl transferases, by the yeast Koji glycosyl transferases. So, in other words, there, there also has not been selective pressure for the yeast glycosyl transferases not to recognize these human intermediates. And sometimes they do, as you can see here. Um, this is a glycosylation site, one site, on a human protein called interleukin-22. Uh, and what we expected in this strain was to get MANOS-5 here, as we do on almost all other proteins that we've tested. But all of a sudden, there was like 30% or more of this new carbohydrate, which we'd never seen before. And so we did all the structural analysis, which is <coughs> quite, quite a lot of work to do, and including an NMR analysis of this to find out that it was this MAN5 structure, but now with a tetrasaccharide on top of it, involving three, uh, sorry, four different glycosyl transferases to build this. So all of a sudden now you make an intermediate from the human pathway, which yeast has never seen before, and the yeast Golgi glycosyl transferases start building on top of that. That's just illustrating the kind of complexity you can get and the kind of non-orthogonality of these modules, um, these glycosylation modules. Fortunately, we could solve that problem um, now, because if you get this, this is likely to be very, very immunogenic. Um, it's an entirely new structure, um, and so you certainly wouldn't want um, to have that in a therapeutic preparation. Okay, so we can build the human pathway into yeast. After a lot of work, that, that, that works, allowing us to make antibodies um, in yeast at like gram per liter quantities in a very short space of time. I mean, mammalian cells you need about three to four weeks of uh, fed batch cultivation to get up to the gram per liter levels that people talk about. In yeast, this takes three days. Okay? So you have a space-time yield, which is at least an order of magnitude better than with mammalian cells. Okay, and then the, the second target that I was referring to is to try and re-engineer the glycosylation pathway to deliver therapeutic glycoproteins to the lysosomes of patient cells. Now, what are the lysosomes? Lysosomes are vesicles inside mammalian cells of which the main function is um, to degrade biopolymers that the cell doesn't need anymore. Okay? This is in a very simplified way what lysosomes um, do, at least one of their functions. And so if uh, for this degradation of biomacromolecules to the monomer um, building blocks, you need depolymerizing enzymes. And there's about 40 of them in the human genome. Uh, that, so genes that code for such um, acid, pH optimum, uh, degradative enzymes. And just one disease is illustrated here of what happens when you don't have such degradative enzyme. So this is in the case of Pompey's disease. Um, there you don't have the um, alpha glucosidase in the lysosomes. And this leads to the accumulation of glycogen in the muscle cells of these patients. And gradually this um, becomes toxic to the cells and the cells lose their functionality. So Genzyme, uh, one of the main biotech companies, one of the oldest biotech companies in the world, um, uh, contributed tremendously to the um, outlook for these patients by realizing that the targeting system for these lysosomal hydrolases involved carbohydrates. Uh, normally when they come from the Golgi to the lysosome, there is a receptor that recognizes mannose 6-phosphate on the carbohydrates. Now this receptor that normally targets these enzymes to the lysosomes is also expressed at the cell surface of almost all of our cells. So if you inject a glycoprotein, such a missing enzyme from the lysosomes, if you inject it in the human bloodstream, if it's modified with mannose 6 phosphate these receptors will capture it and endocytose it and transport that protein into the um, lysosomes of patient cells. So these molecules are amongst the most expensive therapeutics we have today. So the alpha-glucosidase for um, pompous disease sells at about 300,000 euro per year, uh, lifelong for these uh, patients. Um, and in fact, because these molecules are made by mammalian cells today, their levels of mannose 6 phosphate are very, very low. 
on this particular protein is less than 5% on the currently used formulation. So that means eight, more than 80% is cleared by the liver in the first few minutes after injection, and this is not a very efficient uh, therapeutic. Although at the high doses that is used today, it has changed the life of patients, but you know, there's clearly room for improvement in the on the manufacturing side. So what we've done is to take the yeast glycosylation pathway, and yeast by nature builds mannose-6-phosphate-like structures into its cell wall. The only difference being that there is another mannose residue sitting in the way, substituting the phosphate um, there. And that blocks these uh, sugars um, from recognizing the human mannose-6-phosphate receptor. So what we've done is to build the, to, to pump up the levels of mannosyl phosphorylation in yeast cells um, by um, overexpressing the genes that are the rate limiting, catalyze the rate limiting steps of this pathway. And then the question became, can we now convert these kind of sugars into the kind of sugars you need for lysosomal delivery? And we had no enzymes to do that. You could do that chemically without any problems whatsoever, but there is a, prob there is a protein here, very labile protein that you have to keep intact during that conversion. So we figured we needed new enzymes uh, to do that. And then, so this is just, I'll skip this. So this became the question, how are we going to do this? Right. So as always as biotechnologists, I think the, our first reflex is to go out in nature and think about where in nature there might have been um, evolutionary pressure, selective pressure for such enzymes to originate. And what we realized is that actually fungal cell walls Fungal cell walls are very, very abundant carbon sources in the biosphere. Um, so we, we thought there must be bacteria that have evolved to grow on fungal cell walls as their sole carbon source. Um, and in fact, just going through the biological literature, you can easily find a number of um, bacteria like that. One is this particular species, Cellulose microbium cellulans. Um, and so when you grow these bacteria on yeast cell walls as their only carbon source, uh, you get the induction of a whole array of um, carbohydrate hydrolytic enzymes, including some enzymes, as we found, that can indeed catalyze these reactions that we were looking at. Um, so this has been done by these two um, um, very, very good scientists in, in the lab. Um, it was a project that took quite some time, as you can imagine. So um, this is just showing you that we indeed could find such enzymes. And so what you, I'll just walk you through this. So we have... Here are the carbohydrates that are made by this yeast cell that we've engineered to express very high levels of mannose-6-phosphate mannose. And those two peaks here would be structures that contain that. So when we take one of these enzymes um, that we found from this bacterium, uh, which we have um, coined with this name here, um, when you treat that, they, all of a sudden, in capillary electrophoresis, move faster, which means that either they are smaller or they have more charge. And then when we treat those with calf intestinal phosphatase, an enzyme that removes end standing phosphates, um, now they run slower again, showing that indeed these phosphates are now terminal and you can remove them. And we found a second enzyme that then also can remove these mannoses there, and you also need to get rid of those for these ligands to be recognized by the mannose 6 phosphate receptor. So this organism effectively makes two of these enzymes. We also crystallized one of them, this one here, to explain why it worked, and it's all in the paper if you're interested in that. So with two E. coli produced enzymes, you could basically convert the yeast produced uh, mannose 6 phosphate containing carbohydrate into what we really needed for therapeutic delivery. And so this was the effect then, um, if we exposed patient cells, so we took cells from pompous disease patients, fibroblasts in this case, um, because that's the only cells you can easily get from patients. Um, and then we exposed these cells to increasing concentrations of our recombinant enzymes, and we looked at how much enzyme got into the cells. Um, the current therapeutic drug um, had this behavior here. And then our yeast-made drugs, um, we needed about 15 times less of that enzyme to reach similar levels of activity intracellularly. And this is just because we have um, about 15 times more mannose 6-phosphate on, uh, on these drugs. This also translated in a mouse model and unpublished yet in a non-human primate model in increased clearance of glycogen from the muscles of... Uh, um, of these experimental uh, animals, and it's now moving into phase one slash two clinical trials. Because this is a genetic disease, you can actually do phase one and phase two at the same time, 
because a, um, a precursor drug, I mean the current drug, is the protein part is exactly the same. Um, so there's less issues with suspected toxicity of these kind of uh, products. So this is being commercialized in this company called Oxyrain. And so the, the R&D division is in, in Ghent. Okay, how much more time do I have right now? Um, <coughs> 13 minutes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, everything I've said so far is basically taking existing pathways or more or less existing pathways from um, other organisms and putting them into another one, which in, in our case was yeast. Um, and the second story involved the discovery of new enzymes that we needed, um, which were not present in the human pathway, but which we needed to convert the, the yeast pathway into the human pathway. So the next part, um, and this is something that started about five, six years ago in the lab, is um, when talking to biopharmaceutical industry people, very often um, they, they'll tell you that they have to live with carbohydrates on their molecules because that's, that happens to be how nature modifies these um, proteins. And then you have to engineer them to such an extent that they don't harm your function. But if you actually could get rid of carbohydrates altogether in eukaryotic cells for a large number of applications, that's what they would prefer. But they can't because it introduces so much complexity to the manufacturing processes. Um, and it introduces heterogeneity in the pharmacodynamic behavior of these uh, molecules. But you can't get rid of them so far because you need them for protein folding. So that there has been this catch-22 for a very long time. And, and so we figured perhaps it, it was useful if we could find a solution um, for that. Um, and so I'll skip that. If you have questions on what applications would be useful, um, we can come to that. I'll show you a few. So this is what wild-type cells, mammalian cells, do. They'll make N-glycans of the very complicated type that I've already shown you. They also make O-glycans, which can also introduce quite a bit of um, complexity. There's about, um, in the range of uh, about 200 different structures known in humans here, there's about 500 actually known on the O-glyc oscillation side. So there's tremendous um, complexity that can be introduced. So what we made is something we call glycodelete, um, where we uh, re-engineered this pathway, shortcutted it, basically, so that we now s construct N-glycans of this trisaccharide shape <coughs> that is identical to the outer branches of what you normally get in mammalian cells. And then we've taken it one step further, and that's as yet unpublished, where we then um, completely remove heterogeneity, only, li li um, um, re uh, only keeping one glucnac residue at the N-glyc oscillation sites and entirely destroying O-glyc oscillation. Because O-glyc oscillation is not important for folding, with very few exceptions. So you can't get rid of it, actually, um, from mammalian cells and keep the cells alive. Um, this is rather drastic, and it was not known at the moment when we started whether this would be compatible with cellular life. Um, so this is one of the, I think, well, a small example of how sometimes this kind of engineering can teach you more about what is really necessary for cells and for, for unicellular life. Okay, so I think the concept was simple. Um, you re recognize this. From the ER, we get this minus eight structure. And then we wanted to kind of put a pair of scissors in the, in the Golgi, an enzyme that would take off the glycans entirely, but for the last residue here. And then we were hoping that the endogenous glycosyl transferases, galactosyl transferase, and CLL transferase would take that as a substrate and build this trisaccharide, which is identical in structure to what you normally get on the outer branches. So this was done by Leander in the lab, uh, who is still with me right now. So then we started playing, and you need selective pressure, like everything if you do engineering, you need some kind of selective pressure to select for what you want. Um, and for sugars, such tools are less elaborate than for um, proteins and nucleic acids. But what we do have is cytotoxic lectins, sugar binding proteins that have a toxin domain, like ricin toxin there. Ricin toxin binds terminal galactose. Right? And that, if that binds, it will kill you. As you know, ricin is very toxic. Now, if you re-engineer such pathway and you make a mutant that does not make galactosides anymore, then the cells become resistant, right? Um, and in this way, you can select for a glycosylation phenotype in your cells that you want. And we wanted to have these MANOS5 because the scissors that are available um, only recognize such structures. They wouldn't recognize the um, wild-type carbohydrates that mammalian cells produce. 
So then we, we got the scissors from this beast, which is Hypocrea jacarina. That's a fungus that's used for making cellulases nowadays in the biofuels uh, industry. And when we studied the secretome of this fungus, we found that it actually secretes its glycoproteins, modified with just a single glutenac residue, indicating that it must secrete an endoglycosidase of the type that we were after. And so we cloned that gene, and it has this uh, gene structure, if you wish, or open reading frame, coding sequence structure. So it has the internal pre-pro sequence for secretion, it has a catalytic core, and it has a C-terminal pro sequence, a peptide, that as long as this protein is in the endoplasmic reticulum, falls back onto the catalytic core, and we have the crystal structure in the meantime, falls back on the catalytic core and inhibits the enzyme, basically protecting the glycosylation pathway of these eukaryotic cells from this degradative um, activity. And this enzyme, this propeptide, only gets removed in the trans-Golgi apparatus, then fully activating the enzyme um, at the Golgi, which means after the stage where glycans are important in the cell for folding catalysis, which is in the ER. Right? So it kind of activates in the trans-Golgi and then removes the carbohydrates when they're not needed anymore for folding catalysis. So again, we used the lectin trick to select for the cells we wanted. In this case, we used concanavalin A, which binds terminal manosites. Um, and there again, when we remove these terminal manosites with this NDT, as we call it, this enzyme, pair of scissors, uh, we get the glucna, we don't get any terminal manos anymore. And that makes the cells resistant against concanavalin A selection. So we analyze that using this particular protein, which is an important pharmaceutical, human GM, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, GMCSF. Um, and so it has two n glycosylation sites, which you can separate from one another using cleavage with trypsin protease. So that allows you to do simple mass spectrometry on these uh, glycopeptides. And so on the parental cell line, where we got the high mannose sugars, you get these, of course. And then when we um, looked at the same glycopeptide from glycodelete cells, all of that is gone, literally everything. There's nothing detectable anymore. And we get new carbohydrate structures, um, which are the intermediates towards what we want to build here. And now MALDI mass spectrometry is not very quantitative. I'll, I'll spare you the details on how we quantitated this, but we have about 70% of this, about 20% of that, and about 10% of this, just without any further engineering. So we're now engineering this further to pump it towards this um, structure. Um, and so we have good ideas on how to do that right now. So this reduces heterogeneity quite tremendously on glycoproteins. So this is GMCSF. You see the mass here from about 14.5 kilodalton to about 20 kilodalton. All of that is heterogeneity introduced by the carbohydrates. So it took me half, half a day to actually get any spectrum from that because there's so many different forms, sure, so many different forms here that it all tends to go into the baseline. Now in glycodelete, you have remaining heterogeneity, but most of that is because of the O-glycans, which are also present on the protein. This sequence here is O-glycosylated there. So Francis, who is in the audience in the back, um, took this one step further. Um, well, he, he first looked at an application of this. Again, here this is the antibodies, uh, which have this conserved glycan. So if we produce a human monoclonal antibody in these uh, cells, we were looking at would that be helpful in any way for pharmaceutical applications. And what we found is this. So if you inject these antibodies in mice, so this is in mice, I must admit. We haven't done it yet in larger animals. But at least in mice, um, when you inject these proteins from the wild app cells or from the glycodelete cells, what you'll see is that immediately after injection, normally you lose about, and that's true for all monoclonal antibodies, you, you lose half to two-thirds of your antibody in the first half an hour due to so-called biodistribution. But if you actually look in the literature about what the mechanism might be for that, there's absolutely nothing known. There's no rigid scientific experimentation on that. And so you lose it, but we don't know how at the moment. And so exactly at that stage, we lose our glycodelete antibody much less than um, the wild type produced antibody, <laughs> resulting in about doubled circulating levels of the antibody with the same dose. Um, and now, this is huge extrapolation, okay? If you'd be able to do this in patients, what it would allow you to do, if this were your therapeutic threshold, you know, your trough level that you need to have uh, for getting therapeutic efficacy, it would allow you to reduce dosing with a factor of two. And like for antibodies with anti-TN, where you treat against rheumatoid arthritis, against TNF-alpha, um, these patients have to go to the hospital every four to six weeks for injections. 
Now, if you could double that to every 8 to 12 weeks, uh, this means quite a bit for, for patients. And we're certainly not at the end of what we can achieve there. So I think we could get this even much further reduced. And as we go forward in human medicine, monoclonal antibody therapy will be much more driven by patient comfort rather than efficacy. And so this uh, might turn monoclonal antibody treatments into something that you can inject maybe three or four times a year. Yeah. All right, so I'm almost done. So this is the one step further that Francis took it. So Francis also got rid of O-glyc oscillation entirely in these cells. And that's yet to be published, um, but I can show you the result of that. What we did is basically tackle sugar nucleotide metabolism for this. And so this is a Western blot, which is a method to analyze protein heterogeneity, molecular weight heterogeneity. Uh, and you can see here from wild type cells, this GMCSF is hugely spread out, as I already showed you in the mass spectrum as well. In glycodelete, it's quite a bit reduced, but still has remaining heterogeneity due to the o -glyc oscillation and some level of the n glycans, which are not entirely the tri trisaccharide structure. And now in glycodelete cells, it's effectively becoming one band, and the remaining glycodouble deletes, uh, and the remaining um, heterogeneity we have is due to site occupancy of the n glycan sites. So n glyc oscillation sites can be can or cannot be occupied within n glycan. And so if you take off the n glycans entirely, what you'll find is not modified and modified with a single glutenac residue. So I think for the first time now we can actually make glycoproteins in mammalian cells with the same level of homogeneity as we could make non-glycoproteins in E. coli for the longest time. And what we still have remaining is a single glutenac residue. Um, and so that sugar residue which sits on the n glycans is actually chemo-orthogonal to the protein backbone. So we can do chemistry on that carbohydrate, on that monosaccharide residue to couple whatever you wanted to to it um, there. Um, so that's hence my question of last uh, of yesterday. You know, what could you do with more than two or three? I mean, this is another one that we can add uh, to it, and it's made by nature. In case you're wondering, this doesn't do much to the physiology of the cell. Glycodelete adapts completely; it just behaves like wild type cells. Glycodouble delete suffers a bit more, but as you know, eukaryotic cells and living cells go, you can evolve them to adapt to that new um, glycosylation phenotype. And we are still doing that. So we are you know, passaging it through normal cultivation conditions, and it's improving still almost back to normal levels um, of uh, cell growth. OK, so I had one more story, but I'll skip that, I guess. I just will tell you that we have implemented glycodelete technology now also in plant seeds. Um, and this has been done together with uh, Anne de Picker, who is in the department of Mark van Montagu. So Mark, as you may have known, developed Agrobacterium tumefaciens transformation of plants in the very early days of plant biotechnology. And um, we, were, we were struck, uh, I think, as all of you, by the, uh, the dreadful situation of the Ebola epidemic, which happened um, last year, where we had antibodies that could prevent um, the disease, but they couldn't be manufactured fast enough because they were manufactured in a transient expression system in tobacco. Um, and so the, to, to do that in tobacco, you have to grow the tobacco plants, which takes months right, until you have the doses. Um, so what we figured is that if we could implement antibody production in legume seeds, in this case soybeans, um, if we could do that, you could decouple the production stage from the purification stage of um, pharmaceutical manufacturing. So these seeds, as you all know, I mean, legume seeds, you can store them at room temperature for years, and they'll still keep their germinating um, power, which means that all the proteins in there are intact. And so we can actually store monoclonal <laughs> antibodies at room temperature for many years in huge quantities using legume seeds, and then having them available when such an emergency happens to purify the proteins. I'm done. Um, the one problem was that plant glycans are allergenic to a large section of the human population if you inject them in the bloodstream. Of course, we eat plants all of the time, and that's safe. But that doesn't mean if you inject them in the bloodstream that it's safe. And so we engineered out this allergenicity from um, the plants in a very simple pathway, which is implementable in crops. OK, I'm done. Um, this is the funding. There is a poster from our group that I want to point your attention to uh, by Morgan.
And then we have a similar meeting to this one in January. So if, in Ghent is not far away from here. If you want to join, <laughs> feel free. All right, thank you.